um, I'm going to kind of review that again, although you've already, okay, we've already talked about it. Let's make sure the little record button is on. I'm calling it a little record button. It's the most important button right now. <laughs> and more. I think it's recording. Yeah. Okay. So just to kind of un kind of backtrack. So sorry, guys. I got started on this article, but um, this is kind of to address sickle cell, and this is from Nursing 2017, so it's two years old, but it was kind of where we were at the point, so I've just been explaining how sickle cell comes about, which is usually from a hypoxic event. There's complications that's associated with it, but this article kind of breaks it down into how you can understand, you know, about the disease process better. So you have the disease and then you have the trait. And if you, in, in all the forms of sickle cell disease, the, the person that's affected by it has inherited at least one abnormal sickle cell hemoglobin gene S from one parent plus another abnormal hemoglobin gene from the other parent. So the most common form is HBSS, which means they inherited, a, a, they have two sickle cell genes, one from each parent. So the, each of the letters represents the parent's contribution to sickle cell. However, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily say how bad or how severe or what, how many incidences they're going to have. That varies from person to person. You could have an abnormal sickle cell gene S and the person has another inherited gene that's abnormal, but it's an, a CDEO beta zero thalassemia or beta plus thalassemia. So sometimes someone may be uh, thought to have sickle cell, but they may actually have thalassemia. So when we're looking at sickle cell trait, then one of the sickle genes came from one parent and then there may be an abnormal hemoglobin gene from the other parent, which they now title A. So if they have the trait, then they would be HBSA versus HBSS. So if they have the trait, um, really has sickle cell related health problems, and that person can be expected to um, live a normal lifespan. So I kind of buzz through the picture, but this is what a sickle cell uh, red blood cell looks like. And you can see these jagged edges here, these pointy edges here on both sides. Now, normally when you look at a red blood cell, it's more conical in shape, so, but not, I mean, it looks like half of it's missing. And so here's another uh, portion. These edges can, uh, they're sharp, and when they're going uh, through the vessels and things like that, and they can get trapped in joints, they're literally, these pointy ends are poking and pricking at the, at the mm. client, which is the reason why they have pain. It's, not be it's because of these jagged edges that's in the system. Normal sickle cell lives about 10 to 12 days, and a regular blood cell lives up to about 100 in 20 days. And speaking about that, here's just right here in the article, uh, a normal red blood cell lives between 90 and 120 days where a sickle cell lives about 10 to 20. So it's a short time span uh, that you will see with your, your red blood cells. And if we have a sickled red blood cell, then that means there's not a spot or there's less positions available for oxygen to attach to the hemoglobin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, the article kind of talks about prevalence and we know that African Americans are more prevalent to, uh, to getting sickle cell. We have also uh, minorities of Central and South America, Eastern, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, Turkish, Greek, Italian, Asians. So it's not just black folks. So th this is actually throughout several nationalities, although one in every 365 black births um, in America will develop sickle cell, which is pretty significant. So this further gives more you know, information like the pathophysiology and how the hemoglobin becomes sickled and it's less soluble than the normal fetal or adult hemoglobin. So when the oxygen levels or pH in the blood is low, which is kind of like hypoxia, 
then there's changes that happens in the body system. So the hemoglobin S will now become more crystal-like in formation, and the red blood cells will lose its shape, its pliability, its biconcavity, and now it becomes rigid and deformed and sickled and more crescent-shaped. So that's kind of how that process happened. So whether there's the hypoxia is due to illness or whether it's due to stress, this is what brings this portion on. Now the sickled red blood cells are more adherent and their ability to change shape as they move through the circulatory uh, system decreases. So they're more deformed red blood cells. The thickness of the blood becomes more viscous uh, through several processes that, you know, that happens with you know, the sickle cell and leukocytes and platelets and all of that and clotting factors. However, this happens over time. So if the red blood cell is given adequate amounts of oxygen before the membrane becomes too rigid, then it can revert back to the normal shape. If not, mm -hmm. then it's going to start to clump and now you're going to have vascular occlusion that can happen and d decreased tissue perfusion. So, so is that why it's important to have them um, hydrated and like start, make sure that they're hydrated because is that what you know, like, to help with the viscosity, yes. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, to help with that portion. But now you can, now you have the potential for clots and things like that to develop. Mm. So there's some other, th it, it goes through the different types of occlusion. So this is just kind of a chart here to say or show whether you're a carrier. So if both parents are carriers, then if they get the if they get the A gene, the hemoglobin A gene from both parents, then they won't have the disease. If one parent gives them the A gene and the other one gives them the sickle cell carrier gene, then they're going to be an AS or an SA, and now they're just going to be carriers. But if they both get the S from each parent, or if, they, if the baby gets both S's, one from each parent, then now they're going to have the disease. So this kind of outlines. Well, ain't shit else scheduled. That you? Who me? Yeah. Mm -mm. I just heard some noise. Oh, okay. Let's make sure that we're muting. I'm I'm trying. All right. So. The other piece, um, when, let me go scroll up a little bit, this kind of gives some more numbers, but the sickle cells are very fragile. They destroy very quickly be, due to mechanical forces as they circulate. And we talked about how long they live, but the destruction of those red blood cells are very, very quick than the bone marrow can replace. And just think if they had anemia, that would now complicate this process. So the destruction is so quick that they end up with hemolytic anemia, which means the red blood cells are being killed off for a lack of a better word. And now that means what's available for oxygenation. Wait, I'm sorry. Is it increased or decreased? Decreased. It's going to be decreased. So some things that you will see with uh, sickle cell is that they'll have chronic hemolytic anemia, they'll have vasoocclusive crisis, and that's where they get the clots. And a lot of it is characterized by a decreased perfusion to the tissue, and it's very painful. They have very painful episodes. They could have acute chest pain because the cells are circulating all through the body, not just to the joint. So it's going to the heart, the brain, the lungs, the kidneys, all of Everywhere. them. So looking at the vasoocclusive occlusive component, um, we can have macro and micro occlusion. So the vasoocclusion, occlusion along with the anemia will now lead to decreased oxygen supply. It can also lead to acidosis, inflammation, tissue infarction. So I talked about the three I's, ischemia, injury, infarct. Mm -hmm. So the hypoxia further increases the risk of sickling because that's how it starts in the first place. And now the 
the situation is now worse than what it was before. So that prothrombic state results from the activation of thrombin. So this decreases the levels of circulating anticoagulants. So if we don't have enough anticoagulants circulating in the bloodstream, then that means blood's going to coagulate and create clots. The fibrinolysis is impaired and platelet activation are also involved in this basal occlusion. So as a result, you can end up with in-organ damage, cardiovascular issues, pulmonary issues like a PE. There's all these different problems that can develop. So what I like about this particular article, it kind of gives you a picture of what these cells would look like. So here you have a normal red blood cell, and then here you have somebody that has sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here these are the, bon the biconcave uh, shape. Here we have, you know, some sickling there. There's more sickling than, the, than a normal shaped red blood cells. And then we have crisis where now we just have a lot of clumping that's occurred. So this is what's happening to obstruct the blood flow. Okay. So, um, now, how, where did you find this article? Um, from a nursing, from nursing 2017. So this is where it came from. And you can sign up to, to get the article. They do very good articles. And I can send it out to you guys. Okay. Because I saw that it said Lippincott, but yeah, I don't it is a, it's, it's coming out of Lippincott. Hmm. So you can sign up. You should be able to get it now. Um, so let's talk about treatment. So signs and symptoms, you know, there'll be a lot of pain. And one thing we have done as, Amer as you know, traditional Western medications, we have basically taught our patients, take these pain medicines and go away. But that's yeah. not the proper thing to do. So now you have patients that have gone, you know, take the medications there is no further management, no follow up. You know, basically, patients become addicted because if they're in pain, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to take more. Then their body becomes immune or tolerant. And now they end up taking more to get the same result of what they had at a lower dose. So, all of those things are, are you know, concerns. There is a hospital in Atlanta called Grady, they actually have a sickle cell emergency room. So if any patient comes in at, you know, saying that they're having a crisis of any kind related to sickle cell, then what they're going to do is they're going to send them directly over to the ED. They actually have a comprehensive system set up so that way they get their eyes examined, they get, you know, if they have to have a cardiac workup, they have all of those things. Um, uh, ready to go so that way patients can be treated and if they are having a crisis and they give them you know fluids but they teach them how to manage their pain and not just rely on um, medications so you know they give them other tools to be successful Hold on. <laughs> uh, anyways one of the medications we could give them is the hydroxyurea. So this is uh, a long-term administration to help to reduce patients that are having an acute event. So it's rapidly absorbed. They only need to get it once a day, but you're going to give them a lot of pain medication as well to help manage the pain process so that it can eliminate some other things. Um, Blood transfusion, I mean, that's another option that could happen depending on what their H and H level is. What's an H and H? Hemoglobin. Oh, shoot. Um, you were right on the hemoglobin. Boy. Hemoglobin and what's the other one? HCT. What is HCT? Hematocrit? Yeah. Yeah, that's what that, so we definitely want to get that. So we want to get a CBC and a basic chem study, making sure we get the electrolytes, right? Because we don't want to, we don't have a whole bunch of acidosis going on. But um, 
the uh, oral hydroxyurea does increase red blood cell size. It, you know, it improves their cellular deformity and uh, nitrous oxide may be used as a vasodilator. So that may be another option um, that can be used to help to treat sickle cell disease. So other pharmacological processes uh, that may be used uh, may be non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for mild to moderate pain, if not contraindicated, and opioids like morphine. So those are some other options that could be, be potentially used. But they are gonna have them on some IV fluids for sure. And these are all the different types of problems that your patient can have stroke, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, liver, gallbladder disease, splenic diseases, and sometimes, you know, that sickle cell can clump right in front of the spleen and, you know, now cause the spleen to have an inflammatory reaction and, you know, potentially become much weaker. So there's a lot of different pieces that's associated with sickle cell disease. This is what they look for under a microscope. So the, all of these uh, sickled cells here, the elongated ones, that, that's your sickled cell. Uh, we talked about blood transfusion therapy. If they have an infection, then you know, we're gonna give them antibiotics for that, depending on what the infection is, right? Mm -hmm. So or, um, other things it talks about is you know, sickle cell disease and stroke and all of those um, options. There are some investigational therapies and um, doing a, a hematopoietic cell transplantation. So it's limited to children 16 or younger. So if they have severe signs and symptoms and they don't respond to the hydroxyurea, then they may do, you know, do it based on sibling, you know, uh, if they have a donor from within the family. So any questions on sickle cell? I can email mm -hmm. out this article. No, I guess the only thing I had a question on was, no, not really, no. I'll wait till we get to the case study. Okay. All right, so let me uh, stop sharing, and then I'm going to roll up this case study very quickly and see what you, see what you have. Oops, I think I don't, hold on. Almost attached the wrong one. Let me pull up the right one. And there we go. All right. small little adjustment here and then we'll be ready to move on. And this was very short. Did you find the case study to be helpful? I did, yeah. Okay. Did you go back and look at the the um, the books? Well, like the scales, the appropriate scales to use. I couldn't find that. I don't know where. Check your Reese book. My Reese book? Okay. Yeah. Anything uh, related to PD, you need to get it out of Reese. Okay. I thought what I found to be most helpful is the advisor, Lippincott advisor. Oh, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. That one like, really helps with um, piecing it all together and doing the case studies. Okay. Reading, like honestly like re for me reading the pages and all that it's bouncing from book to book mm -hmm. without having the book in my hand it's 
advisor for education was way better. Is way better. Yeah. That. All right. So what you should be seeing is the case study. Oh, there we go. It's like where's my roller? Let me minimize that. Looks like my roller got stuck. All right. So. And this tells you this came out, case study came out of Reese. So you have a three-year-old African-American boy. And we also talked about there's other nationalities that have sickle cell, um, are more prone to sickle cell disease and or trait. So just understand it's not just African-Americans. However, they are the most, um, they are the most prevalent or most prone or or ethnic group that to have sickle cell. So he has a runny nose, a slight fever, vomiting over the past three days. Are any of these events stressful? Yes, all of them. All of them are. So therefore, we need to be look, thinking about, you know, hypoxia Does he have infection? and how that's going to affect the, this little PD pod. He hasn't been eating well, complaining of pain in the right leg, and he's refusing to walk. I would too, with all those sharp edged red blood cells that are now sickled. So this is his vital signs and the blood pressure is 88 over 52. He's coughing. How do you know if this is the right blood, if this is adequate enough? What do you, if what's adequate? The blood pressure. What's the formula for, for blood pressure? Have you guys, you know, gotten that? In skills lab? No. Okay. So it's 70 plus or minus, uh, 70 to 90 plus, uh, or, or times age and years, if I remember cor correctly. Let me just verify that before. And this is for children or for everyone, really? It, it's for everybody. So it gives you the low end and it gives you the upper end. So that way you know if the blood pressure is correct. Huh. Let me see if I can locate that quickly and then move on. I'll, I'll find it. I don't want to waste too much more time on it. But there is a formula, not the mean arterial pressure. It's just like, how do you know that this is a correct blood pressure for your um in for your patient for your pediatric patient for any of them hmm. so but there's an actual handwritten formula and i'm quite sure it's in your lip and cop book or and or your Reese book okay so, for the most part it's like a 70 or some something like a number like that more or less times their age right it's 70 plus their age in years okay so that is, um, that would be, or 100 plus their age in years. But for pediatrics, it's a little bit lower. It's like 70 to 90. So if this is a three-year-old, then this would be three plus 70. The lowest it could be would be 73. The highest it could be would be what? So if the range is 70 to 90, what's then what's the highest it should be for this three-year-old? Would it be 90? 93, because remember it's, it's the 90 oh, plus, plus three, three that's right. Years. Yeah. Okay, so this is how we know the blood pressure is within normal limits. So he's looking um, dusky in the mucous membrane, so it's kind of pale. His cap refill is four, is that good? No, it should be at two. 
It should be two. So this is delayed capillary refill, which probably means we have delayed circulation, okay? So first things first, what additional assessments are needed? What did you have? Well, I, let me pull my thing up. Um, well, first was to assess his pain. Ask him, you know, well, obviously we know that he's feeling pain, but like use the scale as far as asking him the picture scale. Okay, which pain scale would be appropriate? The smiley face one. The faces are flak. Not flak, because flak is for when they can't. Uh, I think the flak from wherever I found it, the brief moment I found it, is like is that that's the one where you like tickle their toes or or see if they're like if their body is like you know relaxed and their face is relaxed or if they're you know sensitive to touch if they like grimacing when they do when you do certain things. Um, but at three, I think is when they said they can point out their, the picture and what they're feeling. So sweets, what do you think? Are you there, Miss Sweets? Sweets, are you going to participate in this one? Okay, maybe not. So, do you, uh, are you able to get your Lippincott resources up really quickly? Yes. Okay. So but, go to Reese, mm -hmm. and then type in the type in the flak scale because I think in your, if I remember correctly, in your notes or in your PowerPoints, it actually, it goes through which one to use, which one not to use. And up to what age. Pain is considered to be the fifth vital sign. Use the flax scale to measure pain in children who are too young to verbally or conceptually quantify their pain. Mm -hmm. Or when language is a barrier, children who are older can express using the pain faces scale. But when did you use the pain faces? When they're three and older? Uh, um, mm. So we'll, we'll find out. This should we should get the question answered here relatively shortly. All right. So here we need we need to know if they're awake, alert, oriented, time, place, and person. Can they track you when you call them? Or do they just have a blank stare? Do they have um, any swelling or anything like that to the musculoskeletal system? So they did complain of right leg pain, so we definitely want to look at that to look for swelling, tenderness, any, uh, look at the skin. A like a neurological exam. Right, so look at the skin, look at the oxygen stats, Look at their electrolytes, which is basically labs, their hemoglobin. Since they are febrile, we want to go ahead and get some blood cultures, maybe a urine culture. Do a weight INOs. Those will be some additional assessments that you'll need for this little PD pod. How can the nurse best assess their pain? That was one of the questions. That's the reason why I ask it. Mine was uh, using the smiley face. I just put using the smiley face and asking him um, because it oh, damn, what was it that I said? Okay. That you can ask him. Um, where, let me see. Like where it was. Um, okay. So the best thing we want to do here is the age appropriate is the faces. Three and up. So you need to understand when to use faces and when to use flat. So self-report is more reliable, but and you can you also ask a parent what words the child uses for pain prior mm -hmm. to the assessment. It did say that always um, a patient with sickle cell, that it always says to trust what the patient says. Like if they say their pain's a 10 to 10, 
and for the most part, like, you know, I don't know, it's what it said. Always believe what they're saying and when it comes to their pain scale. Right, but here you need to understand faces you use for kiddos three and up. Three, correct. And then flack would be younger. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's look at the next one. Question three. What are your treatments? If they're, if the urine cultures come back for an infection, you got to treat the infection accordingly. If the patient's uh, dehydrated, start in with the hydrations and um, that's, I guess that's where I would start. No. All right, sweets, are you, are you on? Are you going to answer one way to assist uh, your classmate out here? Okay. Still no answer. All right. So hydration, as you said, infection management and pain management. And we give them oxygen if it's less than 92%. Oh, that's right. Oxygen. Now, okay. <laughs> How do we, when it's less, when then the oxygen is less than 92%, that's using the pulse oximeter, right? Right. I mean, even for patients with COPD, we want their SATs 92% and higher. Mm -hmm. So if it's less than that, then basically they're, they're, there's no way for the cells to overcome the hypoxia that they have. So this is the reason why we want to make sure that if they are not less than 92, that we apply some supplemental oxygen. I mean, you can start by, as a three-year-old, you may not necessarily get away with a nasal cannula. You may have to do a face mask. Okay. And even that may be sketchy because... Um, you know, most kids don't like anything on their face, so it may be a face mask, but blow by. That may be the other option that, that you have available. Okay. All right, so question four. What pharmacological treatments are used during sickle cell crisis? It said um, what I found in the books for, what was it? For, um, you can use and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like acetaminophen for less pain, but for more severe pain, you should use more of an, like more narcotic size. Okay. So we talk, we talked about hydration mm -hmm. and either D5 or D5 half an S at 150 milliliters per kilogram per day, up to double the maintenance. Okay. So antibiotics like penicillin, and then we have things like we talked about the NSAIDs, but also op uh, opioids. Mm -hmm. All right. What are some non-pharmacological things that you can do with Aiden? They were saying like, distraction, music, relaxation, uh, massage, play, and guided imagery, therapeutic touch. What is therapeutic touch? Because I'm thinking if they're in pain, touching them would be painful. Um, therapeutic, not necessarily in that area, but it's kind of like, you know how you know how sometimes you're uncomfortable and you like kind of rub your stomach. Yeah. And then you, so you that kind of takes away or minimizes or, or the pain. So it's it's just it's different techniques. Um, you know, massages. It's you know kind of move not really moving the pain, but you know seeing if that kind of helps the individual. And what's guided imagery? So basically, they're envisioning being like, you know, in another location, just not oh, where mm -hmm. they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
that's the stuff they tell you when you're in labor. And yeah, you're they, like, they told uh, me okay, my well, stomach is, is cramping and you talk about guided imagery. So these yeah, are all the things, distraction, you know, play with something, TV, music. If they have a security toy, then that mm -hmm. would be something really good. Um, parent cuddling, holding the child, all of those things will help. Last one. So prior to discharge, what are you going to teach the family? The, well, first, that they need to have a 24-hour access to a physician, nurse practitioner, somebody that knows how to handle sickle cell. Then the next thing from what – that was my favorite part was the discharge because that one was not easy, but it was – like it, it all for me, where it all came together um, to – we forget. Um, contact if you're if, if you suspect that your child is in a crisis. Um, they have like unusual headaches, loss of feeling, sudden weakness, or um, avoid extreme temperatures and stress. And there was one more. Oh, something I wanted to ask, um, keep their temperature as close to normal as possible and keep them hydrated at least, I think it was it said something like six, eight to 12 cups of water. Okay. And then um, something I was going to ask was, uh, what was it? Hold on. Oh, the pin is up. I read that it said teach families how to administer prophylactic penicillin. So what, what what is it? What exactly does that mean? Like you just constantly give it to them every month or whenever you feel like they're starting to get sick, wouldn't you worry about penicillin resistance or just them get their body getting used to that? No, I mean, you don't give it to them unless they actually have an infectious process. Okay. So the penicillin is there, you know, I don't know if the baby has an ear infection. Okay. And it's bacterial versus viral. Okay. But if you go back up to the top, runny nose, fever, vomiting, you know, is this um, a GI bug that's bacterial? Mm. And I think that's what they're basically saying is that some of this could be infection driven. Okay. Okay. And so that, that was on there, I uh, had as well. And then a well-balanced diet, um, high in folic acid, uh, rich foods. Yep. So we got that. Let me go back to question seven. There were seven? Here. No, no. Question seven. Oh. So avoid precipitating events. So basically, whatever the trigger is, avoid it. Too hot, too cold overexertion, stress, infection. And if that's usually their source, then they may give them penicillin or maybe it's because they haven't had their immunizations. And all immunizations don't, when they're made, don't necessarily come out on the, the, the output of the product may not necessarily be what it's supposed to be. So there, and the, the CDC knows, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. There's been sets of people that have gotten, you know, polio vaccine, but there was something wrong with the formulation, so they had to get a booster shot. Hmm. So hydration, signs and symptoms of, of a crisis, when to call the doctor. Support groups, those are also, you know, where to get accurate information about sickle cell. Those things would be important to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me pull up the renal calculi. I didn't do that one. That's fine. We'll go through it anyway. So you got to understand that as well. And when it says renal calculi, what are they really talking about? Like a stone, uh, kidney Maybe stone. A kidney stone. That's exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about a kidney stone. Yeah. 
That's what a renal calculi is. So, and a lot of it's from, you know, Cokes. not drinking enough water. Teas. A lot of teas, a lot of soda. So if that's your, your eye opener in the morning for, you know, coffee and all <laughs> that, then yeah, this is going to be an issue. And I believe this was a short one too. I'm just making a small little adjustment here. So the answer doesn't pop up. All right. I think that about clears that up. Did you hear my pooch? I did. Poor thing. He's moaning. <laughs> like, I don't know why you're moaning. He just ate. <laughs> uh, share. I'm going to share this. And renal calculi. All right. So all right. So you have a 28-year-old nursing student woo -woo, mm -hmm. who developed intense flank pain at the hospital site. Why do you think that's even happening? Intense what, what, what? on the at the hospital site. Like she's in the hospital and she got intense flank pain. How often do nurses go to the restroom? Never. <laughs> there you go. I won't say never, but I will just say that going to the restroom is, that becomes secondary. You go when, whenever you get around to it or whenever there's a break in time to actually go. So it's not a guarantee that you're going to be going to the restroom. Because if you have a patient, then you cancel the holiday if you think you're just going to up jump and, and go to the pod. That's not going to happen. Because if you get, depending on how busy you are, you may be stuck like Chuck. So, all right. So now they get to the ER. She's pale. She's crying. She has excruciating back pain near the flank region, and she states she has kidney, she's had a kidney stone before and this feels the same. So she now has a kidney stone or renal calculi, that's her diagnosis. They've given her morphine. She has an order for two milligrams every two hours as needed. What is Ketorolac? What kind of medication is Ketorolac? Ooh, would that be Ketorolac? I don't know. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Okay. But it's pretty strong. And it's, it usually um, works really well with kidney stones. So she's also on IV, no more saline, at 100 mils per hour. And we're going to strain all the urine. All right. Number one. What pain medication should she receive and why? Well, there's the the morphine. Okay. That they're giving her for mm -hmm. the pain and the ketorolac is also for pain, I guess. Mm -hmm. To alternate between the two. Okay. One's every two hours, I guess, and the other one's every six hours. Right. And the morphine, you know, she made other things you need to consider about it if she gets, you know, nauseated or anything like that. That's going to be a problem, right? Because sometimes morphine makes you nauseous. So you're thinking it's, I mean, it's helping, but it's not helping you per se. I had a straight C-section, so mine was pretty good. All right, so let's see. So morphine for acute pain, 
we can give the Toradol. As we said, it's a non-steroidal for pain. Mm. And it's also an anti-inflammatory, so. It would reduce the swelling. Yep, yeah, to reduce the swelling. Ease the stone. Well, that makes sense so that it, you can pass the stone faster. Mm -hmm. If it reduces swelling in the kidney or in the ureter. All right. So when you hear kidney stone, what shape do you think about? The stone or the kidney? The stone. It's usually circular and it's very, um, have you ever seen like, well, I don't know if you, but like they look like lava stones. So is it smooth? Nope. It's jagged. Kind of like those little prickers that be in your grass. They look like that or like the lava stones. If you like if you ever go put stones in a house or, you know, they certain people who don't want to have grass there, they just look all porous and sharp. Okay. Can you imagine that prickly thing going down a ureter? I hear it's like giving birth. It hurts. Some say it's worse than giving birth. So you yeah. have that going down the ureter. And it's literally scratching the, the ureter wall, which is the pain. And if it's scratching it, then you're probably going to end up with blood, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, those are your bigger issues there. When uh, you have somebody with a kidney stone. And they're, you know, they're going to be doubled over. They're going to be in the fetal position. All right. Why did the healthcare provider order the fluid? And should you question and verify this order? A hundred mLs. Well, from my understanding, when you get stones, it's because you're not keeping hydrated and you're drinking a lot of that um, caffeinated drinks and stuff like that. So my guess is she might be dehydrated. And if she's not using the restroom, when just knowing from being in the hospital, you don't ever use the restroom, so you don't drink so that you don't have to. So my guess is she is really dehydrated. Um, but as far as 100 ml per hour, I mean, I would wanna see, I guess, how dehydrated is she before you Okay. I mean, I'm not against it. What, what are some other things you can also do to check hydration status as far as lab values? Um, as far as lab values go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What mm -hmm. chemistry can you do? I don't know. You can do BUN and creatinine. Okay. So we need, she needs to be hydrated and we need to get her peeing. The peeing part will help promote the passage of the stone and it'll prevent additional stones from forming. So there's no reason to question the order. It's, it's correct. Also, if not restricted, then encourage her to drink PO fluids to also do the same process. So when you have patients that have a kidney stone, we also want to make sure that we um, strain the urine. So how do we do that? I can't tell you on that one. Okay. Why do you think it's important to do? Or do you think it's important to do? Well, you guys, if she maybe passed the stone already, or is she passing smaller stones? Okay. So what kind, how would you, how would you catch the stone? How do you strain urine? And anyone can answer. I'm not, I'm not looking for one specific person. My guess is... I don't know. I've never been on the floor, so I don't know how they would strain it. I know, like, for us. Okay, with... sweets, help us out. We're trying to figure out how do we strain urine. 
Are you on or are you there? Unmute your unmute yourself. Can you, can you hear me? Say that say that again. I'm in an elevator. It's about to lose signal. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll get right back on though in a second. Okay. So what you um in order to catch the urine, they have what they call a hat. Oh, and a so hat and a hat it has the like the it's like netted kind of like um it's like small little openings of aluminum fiber strips okay and so, so you're going to put it in the in the commode to um you know have the per you can have the patient either you know they have a, they have a little collecting um a collecting pan and then you can pour it over into the hat or have the patient pee directly into the hat. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's how you collect the stone. And then you send it. What should happen next is that the stone is sent to the lab. Why do we, why do we want to send it to the lab? First, uh, I mean, just, yeah, and whether you did the study or not, I'm just asking because these are the questions that you need to think about and understand, you know, how this would come about. So just why would we send to see the stone? For stone analysis to see if it's like what exactly is creating the stone, if it's made like infections, if it's acids or. Perfect. That's the, you want to send it to the lab to see what type of stone it is. Believe it or not, there's probably like six or seven different types of kidney stones. Hmm. And they're all, they're all from different sources. You know, some from frequent urinary tract infection, some from drinking, you know, the soft drinks instead of uh, uh, water. So um, some of them are small, some of them are big, some of them you have to, you can try and see if you can break it down and then allow the patient to pass. And then some, some of the stones you just straight up have to go in and take out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they vary in size. You can have, you know, a staghorn type of a calculi. You can have just little small calculi, but they, they are, they're not consistent. So you can just have a bunch of them that's collecting the calluses of the, of the kidney and just stay there and they don't move. So this is the reason why we didn't want to try to get them moving. So when substances normally dissolve in the urine, like uh, one, one more common type of stone is a calcium oxalate stone or a malleate stone, a calcium phosphate stone, these um, can precipitate and, and form a solid substance. So they have cysteine stones, which is caused by an autosomal recessive inherited disorder. Hmm. They have struvite stones, which is from aluminum, magnesium, or phosphate that's precipitated in women with urinary tract infections. They have uric acid hmm. stones from purines. So in your Lippincott book, it kind of goes through and explains all these different types of stones. So they're not the same. So there's dilation and stretching and spasming that happens. The patient has that colicky type pain with, uh, you know, freak, with frequency and force of peristalsis contractions, the pain's going to get worse. Um, the inflammation, the irritation, and the edema, all of those things are going to increase. So they, you know, risk factors to developing kidney stones, low fluid intake, dehydration, UTIs, um, an obstruction, a mobilization. So people that are quadriplegic or paraplegic from the waist down um, or paralyzed, not paraplegic, but paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, other things can be family history. Certain medications causes you to have stones to develop stones like your calcium based antacids because remember there's that calcium uh calcium oxate stone right taking a lot of calcium supplements if you don't you know don't get enough calcium within your diet 
high protein, high sodium, high sugar diets also are contributing factors. Patients that have had bariatric surgery, so this is considered a malabsorption condition, they can develop stones. And the reason being is because that bariatric surgery, uh, they're missing the intrinsic factor in, in the gut. Hypervitamin, uh, hypervitaminosis, so basically hype, uh, too much vitamin D because vitamin D increases the uptake of what? Increasing vitamin D. Right, when you take vitamin D, why do most people take vitamin D? So it helps with the absorption of calcium? Right, so now we're pulling in more calcium being absorbed. Oh, you made it up here, lady. yay. <laughs> so um, other things are, you know, age, people between 20 and 49 is where you'll see the people developing kidney stones. So other complications, you can end up with a urinary obstruction, you can end up with an upper urinary tract infection, and UTIs can happen all up and down the urinary system. <clears throat> so, uh, kidney necrosis, hydronephrosis, perforation of the urethra, so it, or the, um, the, the ureter. So if, it, if it's really, really sharp, it can lacerate all the way through. Uh, sepsis, that's another, because usually if, you, yeah, if it's from an infectious source, then they can become septic. So their classic signs is colicky pain. It's like a sudden onset of severe pain that radiates from the, from the back where the kidneys and the ribs come together. So that's the costal vertebral angle to the flank and then to the suprapubic area and the, geni the external genitalia. If it's in the renal pelvis, so if it's actually in the kidney itself in the calluses, then it's gonna be dull pain that's con it's constant. If it's going down the ureter, then the pain's gonna move down from the flank to the lower abdomen and the groin and possibly to the scrotum or the labia. So the pain fluctuates in its intensity. They can have nausea, vomiting, chills, uh, definitely dysuria, which is painful urination, and they can have urinary frequency. So hematuria for sure, belly distension, uh, costal vertebral tenderness. And how you check that is you take your palm and you place it on the patient's back between the rib and the kidney. And you take your fist and you hit your own hand. Just from that little punch into your hand onto um, uh, you know, the patient's back or the kidneys will feel it. And if they're inflamed and having this issue, the patient's gonna let you know, okay? Lab values, a 24-hour urine collection to see what kind of stone it is. That's the reason why we want to collect it. Uh, a UA, um, so we're looking for hematuria. We're looking for pyuria, which is pus in the urine, by the way, P-Y-U-R-I-A. Crystals, um, increased specific gravity. So basically, you know, it'd be over 1.025 or it'd be high up in that area or higher. Urine pH of less than 5.5. Remember, normal is 7, right? pH of 7 is normal. So if you have a stone where the pH is greater than 7, then it's a struvite stone. Hmm. Uh, other urines, what other urine tests can you do? So we got a urine analysis. What else can we do? A culture? We can do a culture and sensitivity uh, to see, you know, what the bacteria is in the urinary tract infection. We need to do a CBC, and what are we looking for in the CBC? Um, the elevated um, white blood cell count. Yes, elevated white blood cell count. Creatinine level. Why are we doing that? To um, to for the kidney function? Yes, that's for the kidney function. Okay, so what type of, and I've, I've kind of broken away from the, the case study, but we're gonna go back to it. So I kind of realized we need to do a little bit more work before we got there. Um, so 
uh, when we're doing imaging or, or diagnostic studies, what kind of diagnostic studies can we do? An ultrasound? We can do an ultrasound. Um, we could do a KUB x-ray, a kidney, ureter, bladder. Or we can do a non-contrast uh, CT scan of the kidneys, so that'll tell you the size and shape and the location of the stones. You could do um, an IVP, which is an intravenous pilogram. So you could do that. And that can tell you the stones or the, it can reveal the stones or the obstruction of the ureter. They can do uh, the ultrasound that can detect if the patient has hydronephrosis or ureter, uh, ureteral uh, dilation, any obstructions or anything like that, or radiolucent cal uh, calculi that's not seen on the x-ray. So they're gonna do copious amounts of hydration. That's how we're gonna treat it. So about three liters per day, unless the patient already has water inside the kidney, which is hydronephrosis then, um, or we're gonna increase the fluids, um, or if there's a contraindication because of comorbidity like heart failure. So other than that, if the person is normal, then we're going to go ahead and proceed with the um, fluid hydration and be very aggressive with it. But if they have heart failure, we can't be that aggressive. We're gonna strain the urine and then we're gonna put them on uh, prophylactic, uh, what am I thinking? Prophylactic um, anticoagulant, that's what I'm thinking. Like the, the SOTS or maybe doing some other um, aspirin, something like that. What kind of diet should they have? So basically- any It depends on what type of- oh. Sorry. Uh, any food that's high in oxalate, like spinach, peanuts, chocolate, uh, they're going to be told to avoid those. Because remember the calcium oxalate stones, which are the most, most uh, common type of stone. They're going to avoid excessive protein and salt intake. Uh, they should have adequate potassium, though. They need adequate potassium. Any juice that's high in citrate, they're going to, um, if they have hypocitraturia, so you'd have to test for that with the 24 hour urine. Increased daily intake of non sugar sweetened beverages so that way they can pee. IV fluids, pain management. So that could be the Ketorolac, it could be ibuprofen for mild pain, the non-steroidal. It could be morphine, it could be codeine. So they have several options. They, if it's a UTI that's the cause and antibiotics like that, then we can give them some um, Zofran, or, you know, if they're nauseated. If they have uric acid stones, then what medication can we give them if they have uric acid stones? We could give them um, allopurinol, so A-L-L-O-P-U-R, I, N, O, L. So those are usually when patients are eating things that are high in purines. So they give them allopurinol or potassium citrate to dissolve uric acid stones. So um, captopril, they could give them that. That's a chelating agent. And then there's several others, if, depending on the stone. This is for a cysteine stone. Thiazide diuretics, such as hydrochlorothiazide, if they have hypercalciuria. Uh, Oral calcium or magnesium. They can give them prednisone. What else? For for pain management? Mm. 
well, we got IV fluids, we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we have antibiotics, antiemetics like Zofran, allopurinol, which is to dissolve uric acid stones. Um, you can use like a potassium citrate or chelating agents like captopril, and that's for, cyst that's for a cysteine stone. You can give that to dissolve the stone and to prevent it from forming. Oral calcium or magnesium? You can give them that. Um, thiazides, you can give those to the hydrochlorothiazides. You can give prednisone. You can give alpha oh. blockers. I was oh, just about to say alpha blockers. There's a lot of different things that can be done. So they have something called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. What is that? It's when you go in the machine and it just hits your flank at like so many pounds of pressure per minute. Okay. So it's like basically is the shock waves are designed to break up the stone for them to pass, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So that's what that's what's really happening there. So how many liters of fluid should they have? Three to four liters. So well, two to uh, I think Lippincott says two to three. Should you strain all the urine? Yes. Yes, you strain all the urine. If you get any particles in it, do you send it to the lab? Yes. Yes, you do. So give any give the analgesics as needed. Check the urine for color clarity and, and any signs of bleeding. Um, Get your baseline lab, so a CBC, your Chem Chem Seven or Chem Twelve. Miss Hudson, yes. With the thiazide diuretics, wouldn't you need to also give them potassium? Is that one of the potassium wasting diuretics? It is. So that will be the other thing they need to look for on the other side to see if the potassium level is low, or if it's you know. Um, if it's normal, but then go low. So they're going to have to monitor uh, labs, which is the reason why I said you need to get a Chem 12. Gotcha. Or at least a Chem 7 if you don't get that. The uh, TED hose, we need to give them the TED hose or do the, the SCD, sequential compression device. If the stone's too big to pass, then we got to prep them for surgery, right? Mm -hmm. And then we got to explain all the risk factors so that way they can prevent developing stones in the future. Okay, so there's, I mean, kidney stones is just not some, you know, wham, bam, and we're done. There's a lot more behind that. So now that you have the backstory to the kidney stone, to answer this question here, it helps to locate the stone and as well as some of them may require dietary restrictions, which we've already talked about, but we need, we need the stone to send it to the lab so we can figure out why the patient is having kidney stones. So let's see if there's any other diseases like parathyroid disease. Why would parathyroid disease be a concern? Oh, I don't know. That just surprised me. The calcium isn't being reabsorbed into the bone. So the parathyroid glands that are behind your behind your thyroid, you have two on each side. So if there's a disease, then you may have an increase of calcium in the circulating through the body. So it kind of goes back to not being reabsorbed. Uh. All right. Uh, I think we got one or two more questions, so let's finish these out. Whoop, four. So she, Alana asks about the calcium consumption. She states she usually takes calcium supplements and she eats dairy for strong bones. How do you help her? How do you counsel her? I mean, first and foremost, let's find out even if her stone is calcium driven. Well, yeah. yeah. There was, I don't think there was anything in the vignette that says she ate a bunch of calcium. So we don't know, you know, or, or foods high in calcium. So 
there is no restriction to dietary calcium. It's, uh, it's not restricted unless the patient has type 2 absorptive hypercalciuria. So she'd have to have calcium in the urine. And then it'd be a well-balanced diet until the testing is complete. All right, so we get the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So what teaching should the nurse provide? And so this is a non-invasive procedure that uses shock waves, as I said, to break up the kidney stone. It could be uh, uncomfortable, but usually tolerated well. After the lithotripsy, then those small pieces may pass very easily. It doesn't mean it's gonna be less painful. And they're gonna go home with pain meds. So they have to strain all the urine for the gravel or grit, which is then sent for analysis. And they may need to repeat the surgery. But if the stone's way too big and lithotripsy just isn't doing what it needs to do, then they're going in and they're going to take it out. Okay. All right. So questions. Why would, um, why would, I guess, um, uh, a... What is it? A anticoagulant be used? Anytime you're hospitalized, because if you get a clot in the kidney, then you have another problem. Okay. But when you go to clinicals next semester, you're going to, you're going to see that um, every patient is on some type of anticoagulant, whether it's a TED hose or something. Okay. The goal is to prevent clots because you're hospitalized. You're going to be doing a lot more laying than moving around. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Any other questions? Next time when you decide to do a Zoom session, can it be when I like? Uh, can it be one of the days that I suggest as opposed to the entire classroom? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Since everybody I, didn't show up. I, I mean, I had to call in to work just to show up to the Zoom session. And that one person that, especially three rows behind me that tried to sit in Martin's chair, was like, uh, can I work that day? And not one, can we just do it one of my days? I mean, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But overall, I try to make it fair. I mean, the weekend, I understand, you know, you study in this, this, that. So, you you know, you're trying to get that last hoorah in. So I, I understand that. However, you know, regardless of when I sent the case study, you, you still should have already read sickle cell and renal calculi not necessarily waiting for me. And then those things, and I even think the malabsorption is on a previous video, mm. if I remember correctly. So you, you, have the, you, you guys have the information out there. I think the only thing I did not cover was hemophilia, but we actually kind of talked about hemophilia from the standpoint that it was inherited disease, right, from the mother. Mm. On that, so it's an X linked chromosome disease, and then we talked about you know the management, you know, what kind of sports could they or, or what kind of exercise or sports could they do? And we talked about the non contact sports. So I just kind of spent the time trying to you know make sure that at least I talked about everything on some level, but whether I discuss it or not, you guys are still responsible for it. So you, you know, you need to do the, the case studies that's provided if there's case studies there. You need to look at the videos, you know, either before or after class. But there's certain things that you guys are responsible for. So, you know, whether you don't rely on me all the time, because some of this is, you know, kind of up to you guys as well. So... You, you know, it's a lot of work involved in your, your outside activities, you know, work and things like that. They have to, you really have to have those on a, on a tight rope to make sure that, you know, you're, you can be successful. So things only get busier as the semester continues.
Makes sense. Mm-hmm. And just to have three people out of 20 people is just, it's, it's mind boggling. But, you know, there's always something to be learned. Even if, even though you guys didn't, may not have completely worked the case study, didn't work the case study, you still got on and then, you know, had a small mini lecture about signs and symptoms, so forth and so on. So, I mean, anything could happen. And I, I mean, I pray that nothing happens to my computer, but just say, for instance, something did, then what? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> just, just food for thought. Food for thought. So do you understand a little bit more about the sickle cell, so forth and so on, and, um, you know, Mm -hmm. the renal calculi? And what I'll do is I I actually downloaded that article, so I'll turf it out. Okay, cool. It's a very good article. I definitely understand a lot more about the renal calculi. I was back and forth from my desk trying to listen to the sickle cell, Uh but... What I did here, it did kind of fill in some gaps from what I was missing or what I didn't quite understand from the reading. Okay. And don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, you've got to ask questions. So I am very well aware that, you know, some of you haven't, haven't been in school for from several months to several years or whatever it is that you're doing in your current job doesn't meet everything of what you learned as a VN. So I get it. Or so I, you just have to, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work with you guys, but I need you guys to be working with me though. So even if you don't get a case study and I try to keep it short. So that way it's the Whittingham case studies. They're great, but they're too long and, it just becomes more complicated and then it takes away from the validity. They're great case studies, but when you already have, you know, 14 exemplars, then you just like, you know, this is just way too much. So then you get frustrated. So I've been working on just making sure that, you know, they're good, but just if they get too big, then it's just kind of like, eh, it's not worth it. Sounds good? Yeah. Yes. All right. So hopefully you're doing the raising the bars. Yes. And they should be short. You shouldn't be writing a whole novel. So I'm hoping that you all are not writing novels to the, you know, to that process. So I think there was someone that asked me about that a couple weeks ago. And, you know, we may start looking at, um, you know, I'll talk to Miss Johns to get her thoughts about it on, you know, a way to, to demonstrate how the raising the bars should be done. So that may be more helpful than anything else. Because then you'll, you won't get so bogged down in the militia. Yeah, because I was doing some of, um, I did get catch up or caught up in doing it really detailed. Um, and then when I studied with um, oh, the girl that sits behind me, Brandy, a little bit, we were all kind of sharing like the bars, trying to figure out like who's got a better one or who, like how detailed is it or how less detailed it is. And it was me and we couldn't figure out. Like what? But mm-hmm. Brandy had a lot more detail than I did, and so I thought, well, well maybe my mine's not as detailed. Like, how, what are we looking for? Right, but think about it like this: if you put all that detail, the whole book. Yeah, you're just rewriting the book. The book's been written, so there's no reason to rewrite what's already been written. Just, you know, just kind of my thoughts. It's, and this goes down to the paraphr- uh, paraphrasing. Uh, you know, that way you kind of understand to your ability. 
Mm-hmm. Kind of, in nursing, you have to know a whole, you have to know a little bit about everything. What were you going to say, Sweeps? I didn't hear you. When I read, I was doing the highlighting. And so I would, I would, um, it's a little feature in Lippincott that a term like what you've highlighted into like a note. And okay. I compare that with what I do in the raising the bar and look at the overlap and mm-hmm. kind of add in like on the back of my raising our pages, like small details. Like if I left out a particular type of medication, but I made note of it in the little note that I had from my highlightings, okay. then I'll add that onto my raising the bar. Awesome. Awesome. So, I mean, there's different ways to do it. You know, there's many, many ways, but the biggest thing is don't get, don't drown yourself in the minutia of the material. And I think that's what ends up happening is students end up drowning themselves in the minutia of the material. And then before you know it, you're just like, um, hold on. And that becomes super frustrating. Mm -hmm. So because you get overwhelmed and you're like, how am I going to learn all this stuff? This is just, it just becomes too much. So you just have to focus on that piece, you know, not uh, getting caught up in the minutiae.